Welcome to Tank Talks, your personal think tank for startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. This week's episode is a conversation I had on Clubhouse with Chris Harvey, a venture capital lawyer who focuses on emerging fund managers, accelerators, and other kinds of venture capital investors. Chris and I discuss everything there is to know when it comes to setting up your first venture fund and all the nuances and complexities surrounding venture law. Chris is such an amazing resource, and I truly learned so much from him, even after launching two venture funds myself. Chris really has all the answers. Now let's get into the episode. Thanks everyone for joining us for our next Ripple Ventures Tank Talk on Clubhouse. Today we have Chris Harvey to discuss uh, Merging Manager Legals 101. Chris Harvey has been practicing law for 12 years as a venture capital lawyer with a focus on emerging fund managers, accelerators, and venture capital studios, as well as general partners and other venture investors. Chris regularly represents venture capital fund managers and investors in structuring fund formations, transaction documents such as LPAs, LLCs, operating agreements, Series Seed and Series A mergers and acquisitions, and all matters related to venture capital lifecycle. Chris is based out of Los Angeles and shares some amazing content on his own blog at lawofvc.substack.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Chris. Hey, you're welcome, Matt. Thanks for, uh, thanks for putting this together. Absolutely. Let's kick things off with uh, a very important question that I know I went through when setting up my first fund, which is for most emerging managers, choosing a legal partner might be the most important non-partner partner role to hire for. What do you think are the most important things for first-time managers should know when considering who their legal counsel should be? Venture capital is kind of a, a different beast than just any type of other fund. So uh, often if you kind of just take a pulse on the industry, you'll, you'll hear people say that uh, venture is a uh, subset of private equity or a subset of other private funds, but it really it's its own category because it has its own exemption. You know, I want to kind of narrow the, the scope here and just say, if you're raising a fund, make sure it's, it's venture capital strategy. Venture capital strategy is, is actually a, uh, it's a term of art and it, and it actually has a legal definition, but generally it's investing into startup securities, uh, safes, you know, price rounds, and it's taking a direct position in the company. So just be sure that you're, first of all, you're qualifying yourself as a VC fund before you uh, listen to me because my advice is kind of tailored towards that, uh, that type of client. But um, the most important thing you really should know is uh, there's not a huge number of fund counsel out there. In fact, when I started kind of really focusing my practice in this uh, three years ago, uh, I took a look around and I, I actually didn't find anybody um, in my network that actually did what I was doing. So I kind of just created a category called emerging fund lawyer, uh, kind of set out to, to really learn the space, you know, from, from bottom to top. And then over time, I picked up some independent lawyers that are in my network. You know, people just kind of, you have to really look under the rocks to see if there's fund lawyers out there uh, that practice in this space, because most of them are at a big firm, you know, like Cooley Gunderson, uh, Wilson, you know, these, these were, these are always been, have always been big firm positions. So, you know, the first thing you kind of want to do is understand that, you know, there are fund counsel out there that aren't at big firms, um, but um, you kind of, you need to know, you know, what, uh, you know, how big your fund's going to be and generally what you want to spend on legal. I think for emerging managers, especially first-time managers, your legal counsel is your best friend. They are like literally holding your hand the entire way through. Uh, at least that's what I found because there's so many nuances when it comes to learning about the venture capital legal process and how to set up the funds and all the different entities. But I guess maybe let's get into some meat of it. Like what sort of questions should be on the top of the list when asking counsel about setting up your first fund? Well, I mean, I really think it's comes down to experience, you know, have they, do they specialize in this category? Are they actually an emerging fund lawyer? And so, you know, if you're not sure, just ask for, a, you know, sheet, do your due diligence. Really the best managers that I've worked with have actually asked for uh, references. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give those out. And I think, you know, any fund manager that really takes it seriously and is really, you know, ready to step up to the plate uh, should be knowing who they're working with and at least getting a, a, a gauge from, you know, other fund managers out there. I think probably the worst thing you could possibly do is give your buddy a call who is not in venture capital and say, who do you know as a lawyer uh, to help me out? Because it's just a crapshoot on who you're going to find. 
It sounds like it's also like for startup founders who are choosing their friends who just graduated from you know law school themselves and saying, hey, can you help me set up my, my startup? Not the right thing to do. Definitely not something you want to be doing because, you know, it's just not the right way to set yourself up for success. Can you tell us maybe some of your like worst horror stories without giving any names about someone who just, you know, went to go set up a fund. They talked to you, but said, you know what, I'm just going to go use my friend who's a bit cheaper around the corner. And they ended up obviously getting burned. Oh, it's funny. It's actually, it's actually the opposite. Usually they say, well, you know, they, they talk to me, but they're like, you know, I really kind of need somebody that has prestige. You know, we want somebody that has, you know, that, that, you know, when the LP see the name on their fund deck, you know, they say, oh, this is going to be an easy close. And so that's the mindset that fund managers have. And so uh, I remember one time I was working uh, with a, with a client. Uh, we didn't, we didn't actually start the fund work paperwork, but she said, uh, you know, I want to, I won't name the name, but I'll use a big firm. And so I was like, yeah, that's totally fine. You know, I totally understand you know, where you're coming from. You know, we co-counsel, uh, you know, we handle it solo, but you know, if you want to go off and up the ladder, if you will, fine by us. And she came back two months later and her bill was over six figures. And she was literally in tears saying, you need to tell these people that like, this is too much. And I said, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but I mean, had you asked me the question, I would have told you, you know, these, the average fee you're going to be paying with a firm like that is going to be well into the six figures. You know, I just didn't know what she expected. Yeah, I guess so too. I mean, I know what our fund costs to set up and it still blew me away and it was apparently cheaper than other people had paid. So you're always blown away when you see the legal bill, but we'll, we'll save that for, for another Clubhouse chat. When talking about uh, fund structure, you know, what are the most important things about setting up a standard LPGP fund that will make fundraising the least restrictive when it comes to the LP pushback? Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to alignment. It's, it's kind of gone back and forth, but really the first thing that LPs look at is just sort of your management fee structure. Uh, that's really where there's a miss, there's a potential for misalignment. Uh, and the reason being is it's, it's the one that it, it goes straight into your pocket and there's not a shared risk. And the other thing, oftentimes, you know, management fees are, uh, you know, more or less guaranteed to be, to be issued regardless of fund performance, regardless of how well you are in the game. And so there's a, there's actually a, a long, history of drop-offs between fund one to fund two. If the investor doesn't think you're going to end it for the long haul, and I mean, there's plenty of opportunists out there that are jumping into this game right now. If you already have the competition out there and you're stacked up against it. So I, I would say, make sure that you're not asking for too much or too, too quickly. Uh, make sure you have enough cushion in the bank so that you can you know, negotiate your fee down uh, if need be. And I would stay within the 2% to 2.5% range as a management fee. And if you're a first-time fund manager, it's kind of understood that you're going to get a 2.5% uh, accelerated fee structure up front. And if you know if you can afford to uh, consider, you know, taking even less than that. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, what you can really set yourself up for is just make sure, making sure that you're following the just standard uh, terms down down the middle as much as possible. And uh, you know, you don't want to be too LP friendly, right? So you don't want to take the ILPA. Uh, start with that position because there's some things in the ILPA, uh, for example, a hurdle, and and we can go into what a hurdle is, but you know any kind of preferred return is generally something that's not done at the uh, you know at the first VC level. I think I, I saw somewhere in different funds, which is a survey, at, well their company, but they ran a survey, and they said about 33% of funds have a hurdle in it. It, it kind of reminded me that the a uh, person who went to the, the higher firm actually had a hurdle in hers and said, I want a hurdle in my, in my documents because it <laughs> gives me the advantage to say, I'm serious about this. Unless your lead investor is really screaming for it. You know, I would just, ILPA says they're, they're more common than, than I think they are. But, you know, if you do a survey, they, they seem to be very, uh, it's, not the, it's not the middle of the road. So don't be too pro-GP friendly. Don't be too LP friendly. Try to get, you know, more down the middle. Yeah, it's really interesting on the management uh, expenses side of things where you actually are playing the short game versus the long game. So, you know, if you think about it, uh, if you take a higher management fee up front, people got to pay for their lives. They got to put food on the table. I get that. But one, you have to pay that money back before you get anything, first off. So all fees have to be paid back, including management fees to LP. So it's not like you get that money. And two, it takes really long, especially as an early stage fund, to get some of that carry out 
But if you can invest more early on, you actually might have a better chance of getting to that DPI one quicker. Um, and so it makes sense to take less management fees up front if it incentivizes more you know, LPs to join the fund versus trying to do a higher management fee and sort of a middle of the road carry, wouldn't you say? I agree with that. Of course, there are different priorities for LPs depending on whether institutional or high net worth. And of course, GPs have a different um, viewpoint, but you know, we can get into more of like what those terms are and, and how they how they differ. Yeah. I mean, I'll put it out there. We totally fucked up in our first fund um, and it was my fault. We ended up uh, doing the standard two and 20 and we uh, paid all the management fees basically once a year and we called all the capital up front. So we just totally screwed up how we set up our fund one. But I learned the lessons for fund two and we'll get into that. But for anyone out there listening, um, really make sure you talk to a lawyer like Chris or any other counsel out there and exp- get them to explain to you how management fees work, how uh, capital calls and, and all those sort of DPI things work, because it's really important for you to understand how you actually put, you know, Mula and the Kula later on, uh, rather than just thinking about the money you get in one year one or year two. So let's talk about the the, the fund expenses thing, because that was something that a, a lot of people had uh, some questions on. You know, what kind of expenses are market these days for GPs to be expensing from the management company versus the LP vehicle? Yeah, let's talk about formation expenses, because that's kind of part of the fund expenses. And that's always covered by the partnership. So it's split, you know, according to the uh, partnership percentages. You have to look at your fund size, number one, to see kind of you know where this lands at. But just on a typical micro VC fund, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, I think the average uh, formation expense cap is around $230,000. And so that'll get you your legal fees, that'll get you your accounting fees, that'll get you your back office fund administration. And, um, you know, maybe set aside some, some money for uh, franchise taxes and things like that. So that's kind of the, the first thing you got to uh, throw in the mix is the formation expenses. That's generally understood. You're going to, the fund's going to share in that. It's not a, you know, GP item. It's not, um, after that point, you know, it really becomes, you know, a level of negotiation. I think some, some expenses are always clearly in one bracket and those would be like your office expense or your software, or your, you know, your, your day-to-day, um, operating expenses are expected to be covered by the, the management fee, right? So, um, you know, you shouldn't get too greedy on that. Now, on the flip side, if there's fund administration fees, if there's uh, things that the partnership can actually appreciate as opposed to the GP, you know, going out and doing, you know, their own their own work, you know, you can make that a negotiated item to put in the fund expenses. And, you know, these things have kind of downstream impact, which is why they're heavily negotiated. You know, when you're, when you're talking about drawdown capital, um, there's other triggers that, that kind of involve how much capital is being consumed by the, by the fund. Um, those expenses will actually factor into those formulas. So that's why it's not just, hey, you know, you, we'll cover it on the management fee or we cover it. It has downstream effects. Yeah, so let's give it a, an example. So fund administration cost. Some people say it should come from the management company. Some people say it should come from the LPs. Which way do you think the market is going these days? So investors are paying more attention to the details. And and so it used to be that fund administration fees were pretty much always covered as a a, uh, fund expense, especially on the financial reporting and the accounting side of it. But now that um, you, you have kind of companies that are taking over multiple roles, you know, so uh, a fund administrator can charge, let's call it $25,000 a year uh, to track your, both your accounting, your financial reporting, uh, capital calls, everything that goes with it. Uh, sometimes, you know, those fees are getting higher and higher. And so L- LPs are starting to look at that and, you know, saying, is this a critical function of the fund or is this, uh, you know, things that could be done that you're outsourcing and we'll put it on the other side. I would say most of my funds have the fund pay for this as a as a standard practice, um, but I have seen you know some LPs uh, kind of throw up a flag and say, "Hey, look, we're paying for too many fees, and this is cutting into our into our interest." So we we prefer that you know you cover some of these fees through the management fees. Yeah, I guess it makes sense to to compromise putting a cap on it, um, and then saying you know we'll include uh, fund administration, you know CFO services, 
all that kind of stuff up to a certain amount. Uh, and then the rest has to flow over to the management company level, which definitely seems like a fair compromise these days. Let's move on to GP commitments. Uh, this is a big topic, especially with a lot of emerging managers who come from diverse backgrounds uh, who can't afford to make those commitments. You know, How have you seen the GP commitments change over time uh, since you've been working with emerging managers? And now with rolling funds and GPs putting their management fees into the fund as a GP commitment, how are you seeing that changing going forward? Yeah, so I think the old way to think of this was, is the, and it depends on, of course, if you're in U.S. or outside of the U.S. Outside of the U.S., this has always been a point of contention, but in the U.S., it's generally understood you're going to, you're going to front one to 2% of the capital commitments of the fund. And then, you know, over the last maybe five years, there's been kind of a um, the broader question as to why, you know, why is that one to 2% just a standard fee? Uh, because some GPs can clearly, no problem, can afford that. Other GPs are getting their feet wet and, you know, maybe don't have liquid capital to, to throw at that. So uh, you've seen AngelList actually kind of pioneer this program where they're they're offsetting their management fee, you know, to pay for the GP commit. You know, one, one of the fund managers that I was working with, she said that, you know, hey, what I'd like to do is actually take out 80% of my management fee that would go into my pocket and just offset offset that amount into my GP commit. So there's not like a huge outlay for her. And it worked really well because uh, the LPs believed in the mission, believed in her and said, you know, we really think this should be about skin in the game. You know, is this something that you can, are you really putting your financial uh, bona fides down and, and, and showing your cards on the table as opposed to saying, you know, I just don't want to pay for it because I just don't want to, you know, I don't want to put my funds out. Or is it really a matter of, you know, maybe I could afford it, but it, it would strain finances. Um, this allows me to have the freedom to operate without losing that skin in the game and standard. And, and by that, just like, you know, what what's the net worth? You know, where does this fall under this? And, you know, is there external circumstances other than this, hey, we need one to two percent for you to commit to this fund that would allow uh, the LPs to be comfortable with that? Yeah, I mean, I've heard Low Tony spoke, speak about this. He spoke about it on our previous podcast. It, it should be a percentage of your net worth versus the size of commitment. I think that is totally fair. Uh, and if you're you know, asking people for money, they should have the right to also ask about your financial situation because it is such a long commitment when signing up for a fund. So they want to make sure or they should want to make sure how financially sound you are. And if it does represent a significant portion of your net worth and it's only a you know, $50,000 check or something like that, that, that is a lot of skin in the game for a lot of people. Uh, so I think you know, hopefully the industry starts to move more towards that. Maybe you can explain the difference uh, between clawbacks and catch-ups for people who have never used them or never heard of them when it comes to, to setting up funds. Sure. So clawbacks actually go uh, two ways, right? There's a GP clawback and there's an LP clawback. You know, really this comes down to, this is, this is an economic and also, you know, involves alignment between the GP and the LP. Clawbacks are just the process of recovering excessive profits. And so usually it depends on whether you're doing a deal by deal uh, distribution waterfall, or which is mostly what, it, what happens in the U.S., or if you're doing whole fund uh, return carry, that's typically done outside, like in Europe and everything. So, you know, when you get investments come in, you, you know, the GP is going to make some decisions. Do we reinvest these, recycle these funds, uh, to redistribute these pro proceeds to uh, partners? Um, and the first waterfall, often the LPs will get their money back, you know, their, whatever they put into the fund, the return goes to, goes to the capital contributions first. Once that threshold is reached, then it goes to the second part of the waterfall, which is uh, typically a split. If there's no preferred hurdle, a preferred uh, rate, it goes to you know, the carried interest you know, versus the LP uh, split, usually a 20-80 split. So assuming there's a two and 20 model, 20% 20 of the profits go to the GP and then 80% goes to the LP. But what often happens is you get you know, things that come up tax issues, for example, what a lot of fund managers don't realize in the US is QSBS qualifies your early stage investments provided, you know, you meet those five elements of a qualified small business stock. And, you know, this can have a substantial change in the returns, um, you know, up to, you know, considering 20%, you know, for the, uh, for the calculation of the uh, carried interest, though, everything's passed through, right? So you assume the highest tax bracket 
you know, when you're issuing out tax distributions and you assume that the highest tax bracket, you know, when you're, when you're sending out the money. But sometimes what happens is you either end up with more or less, you know, at the end of the fund cycle. So after the, at the end of the fund term, if there's money that the GP should have received or that received that shouldn't have, basically the LPs can call back and say, hey, you've taken more than 20% profit. You know, we, you need to send back the money. Same thing on the LP side. Sometimes the LPs will get more money than they should have. And so, you know, the, the actually for rarely does it happen, but usually if there's an identification or some sort of major uh, liability that the fund has to take over, the GP can actually go back to the LPs and say, hey, you know, there's been a lawsuit. There's been something we have to claw back all of our uh, funds on this one investment. We're going to need that money back. LPs will say, well, you know, uh, obviously this has happened enough that they've said, well, in a, under the ILPA, you know, there's typically a, uh, there's a threshold and that usually is a fourth. The GP can't claw back more than a fourth of what the LPs received. And there's usually a cap in time and, and, and year. And so uh, drawdown is just, is that what your second question was? What's the drawdown? Well, no. So just on clawbacks, you know, it's interesting. Clawbacks sound like they're used way more often uh, with the American waterfowl deal by deal payout um, because there is so much movement in capital gains. And in the European waterfowl, which we are set up because we're a Canadian fund, uh, so it's a whole uh, fund return before there is a carry payout. Clawbacks really are just used in that legal scenario or uh, taxes or things like that. Uh, because everyone is getting their initial capital back plus a hurdle or preferred. Um, so it's interesting to hear how the American waterfall can be twisted in a negative light when there's clawback issues that arise of excessive profits and things like that. Because uh, we don't seem to have that with the European waterfall. It's only used on the, the taxes and things like that. Is that is that my understanding correct? Yeah. And in fact, I think it's probably the number one most negotiated item from a GP's perspective. Yeah, it was nothing for us when we set up our fund because we had the European style. So who knows what's right or wrong. But on the catch up side, so for everyone out there listening, catch ups are basically a way for the venture fund, the GP uh, to get collected on the initial carry once the uh, all the capital has been paid back and the, the hurdle or preferred has been paid out. They get a catch up on the profits uh, in excess of that first. And then the, the rest of the profits are, are split, you know, 80, 20 after that. Correct, Chris? Yeah, that's the principal amount going to investors. I probably should mention in a whole fund carry, like and, and where there's a uh, a hurdle, that really becomes important. Uh, that's where the mis misalignment can happen. You can you can return a lot of funds um, back to the LPs, but the GP still doesn't get their share. Right. So let's let's double click on that. The hurdle rate versus the preferred rate. So let's explain to everyone what the difference is and and what we're seeing in the market and maybe why they're uh, required by certain types of investors. Again, a lot of people conflate private equity, venture capital, um, and a hurdle in a private equity setting or a hurdle in a typical like real estate investment, very common. Most of the time you're going to say, hey, we're going to try to make, you know, five to 8%, maybe sometimes 7% is kind of the median on our, on our money. And that's per year. Uh, if we don't hit that hurdle, then we don't partake in the carried interest. Right. And so uh, again, this is probably, I'd, I, I saw the Stats on this, like less than a third of VC funds are getting those kind of terms. But the ones that are getting them typically are being led by the industry that's, that's kind of more used to those, uh, you know, those percentages. Uh, but the, you know, whole, cold hard facts of venture is that getting a carried interest is actually, it's, it's not as common as you would expect. It's a power law, right? Distribution. So it, it also disincentivizes risk, right? So if you know that um, if, if you strike out on, on some deals that aren't going to return the fund, you have to hit that hurdle rate, you know, you may be less inclined to, you know, put the money out. And so what they've found, I mean, studies show this is it reduces your risk from a, a GP's perspective, but it increases the risk and you have lower returns um, from the LP's perspective. So that's why you don't really see it on the venture side so much is because unlike private equity, which is usually a very set set of terms, there's a set uh, business, you know, there's, there's a lot more manager hands-on work from the, you know, from the fund on the VC side, it's oftentimes, you know, just getting the right selection and, and, you know, getting the right bet up front. Yeah. And also I think you go, you got to see where people are coming from with their prior investing experience. Like you said, if it's real estate or private equity, you're also not targeting the type of IRR or MOIC multiples that you are in venture, 
uh, you know, you're targeting high teens, let's say, in kind of private equity, low teens in real estate. Uh, and so that's why those preferred uh, and hurdle rates make sense. But like you said, they should become irrelevant if you're going for that type of 3x uh, net return in venture. And then these things become so minor, but they also could work against you if you do have a lot of zeros early on, you may be incentivized to sell off your winners earlier than you would like to uh, hold on to them, let's say, to get over that hurdle. So you make a little bit of a carry, uh, which could backfire for everyone, right? Exactly. Yeah. The point I'll say, the last point I'll say on this is the uh, ILPA, which is the Institutional Limited Partners Association, goes out of the way to say that hurdles are, are more common than people think. If you survey the industry and you, and you, you, know, you follow the trends, rarely do I see GP saying, that's the case. Um, so just be careful about that. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, let's move on to uh, some other topics like reporting requirements. What kind of reporting should GPs get right from the start? Uh, and which ones can they add over time when more institutional investors say join fund two or fund three? Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to have just, you know, your basic financial reporting. Oftentimes you would expect to have at the, I mean, at, at about absolute minimum, of course, by law, you have to have K-1s uh, in the U.S. But anyway, so tax, you know, tax reports, typically they're done, you know, within 90 days, sometimes as early as 45 days after the, after the end of the tax year. I oftentimes see financial reports, uh, quarterly financial reports, usually unaudited, you know, whether they're reviewed or not, that's kind of an additional standard that you can look at. Audits only come into play if there is significant need from the LP base. So endowments typically have audit requirements, any kind of nonprofit Typically, we'll, we'll ask for, you know, any kind of pension fund will definitely ask for audit rights as well as audited financial statements. And sometimes, you know, those are even required by quarterly. So the, the key really is tied to your LP base and where you're at in the fund cycle. Yeah. So I guess it's a little chicken and egg, though, because you don't want to over report uh, in, in your initial LPA and then have, let's say, a, a larger uh, LP come in and say, look, this is this is great. We would want this, but we also want to add all of this as well. So would you say like hold off and wait to see what kind of uh, investors reporting requirements they need before you kind of just offer everything up when crafting your LPA? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, be careful the more that you add, you know, if you're going to be adding monthly and quarterly reports, you know, these are obligations that require a lot of time. And, um, you know, you can't just ship this off to your fund administrator to get done without any input from the manager, because oftentimes, you know, you're, you're sending off documents, you're tracking down documents, you know, you're um, in tandem with closings. And so these are kind of a nuisance. Quarterly reports is kind of like the general standard, but if you're doing monthly, which I've, I've seen some LPs require, it really creates a burden for the manager to be more active in the financial reporting. And if you're not familiar with that space, it, it can really drag down your uh, operational bandwidth. Yeah, I mean, so for our first fund, for everyone out there listening, we did monthly reporting, but that wasn't required in our LPA. I just wanted to do it because we were asking our portfolio companies to report on a monthly basis, and they still do. But we've switched to quarterly reporting for the most part on uh, our first fund now that we're in our third year, and our second fund is quarterly reporting, and then the annual audits and all that stuff as well, financial statements. But you just mentioned something on on closing. So rolling closes versus just the initial close or one final close. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I know we've had to do first initial close and then kind of rolling closes until the one year anniversary. But what do you see in the market and what do you recommend for emerging managers to consider? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're not going to have one final close and one round only. I don't think I've seen that yet in uh, years I've been practicing. So um, what I often see, just unless you're, you know, just overcommitted through the roof, is you'll have a one, a one fund close. And most law firms say, hey, we just kind of need, you know, once a quarter just to line up the securities disclosures, to line up the, you know, the inertia to get the documents and subscription process started. You know, assuming you're fund one or even in fund two, you know, you're probably going to expect multiple closings. And so what I would say is, does two things. Number one, practically it's smart to have a closing date and get everybody, you know, either on the fence or off the fence, right? You don't want people straggling. Setting a definite date gets people off the fence one way or the other. It also moves a little bit of the FUD, you know, fear, and uncertainty and doubt, and so make sure that people jump in if they if they want to. And um, you know, I would say don't manufacture dates, you know, don't come up with a hard date and then keep moving it. I would say um, 
wait until you have a certain percentage committed. I, I usually tell my clients 20, 30%. You have LPs that are circling that, that uh, soft commitment around 20, 30% and making sure that your lead is ready to go, um, giving them enough time to you know, uh, move funds out so that you're not closing too early. Um, also, what I've seen in the marketplace is signature page gathering, right? So funds often work on a basically like a almost like a vacuum, right? So you send out the subscription documents, you know, say, hey, we're closing three weeks from now. Um, you get these people to submit their signatures over time. You don't need everybody to submit their signature pages on one day. You can collect it over time. What I found is the earlier you do that process, the better. And the thing is, when, when you collect the signature pages, you don't need to actually have a date certain on there. And in fact, you'll always have it undated when they sign it because the GP's job is to collect all these commitments as they come through and then look at them, make sure they run the regulatory checks on this because funds are very unique in that there's a lot of uh, checks and balances that go into the legal process. And so if you're not getting those checks and balances from your, from your law firm, then you're probably going to be stepping over some lines, especially for Section 3C1 funds, which we can come back to, but essentially non-Uber wealthy funds, which is what most fund ones are. So you take some time to process those subscriptions. And then once you have enough critical mass, you, you, know, you put a date certain on it and say, okay, you know, the people on the fence were, were closing on this date. You know, it's now or never. And you hope to God that you actually get the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, worst case scenario, you close with the ones that you have subscribed and then the other ones on the fence have left. It's a real, instead of a rolling close, it's a, it's a roller coaster close uh, because you're getting all these uh, subscription uh, documents getting together and then you say, okay, you know, money's coming into the bank today. I'm calling 25%. And then you have a lot of people who say, uh, you know, I'm not going to decide now. I'm just going to wait till six months in to see what your first couple of deals look like. And then, on, you know, I still have another six months to decide. How do you think about that? And how do you think managers should treat those types of sort of second and, and third and fourth closes or the rolling closes after the initial one who want to get a free look at some of the deals that are coming in? And you could always say, no, I get that. But, you know, capital is capital is an early stage fund. So so how do you think people should handle those types of LPs? Yeah, so those are usually you put a limit on the time period that you can take in additional LPs because, you know, the LPs that commit also don't want you to go out and take somebody on three years later after they've seen all the risk, you know, leave the, leave the barn. So what they'll do is they'll say, you know, we want 18 months for you to get any stragglers um, to come in there and close. And so in that intervening time, uh, there's one of two things you can do. One, you can, you've started making investments. Um, so you're, you're deploying your capital and you're letting the ones that are on the fence know what, what's, what's happening. Typically what I often see is there's some sort of charge for coming in later. So you'll have either, you know, prime plus 2% that you'll charge the, the new LPs you know, or you'll have some sort of set fee that, um, you know, also a catch, a catch up fee. So they, they pay back for, you know, all the, all the fund expenses they miss out on, uh, as well as, you know, their first capital call. You know, what I would say is you want to make, I mean, you don't want to manufacture it, but you really want to make sure that the hype matches, you know, the activity that you're putting and always, always, always want to keep those investors that are interested in the loop because you never know. I mean, oftentimes what happens is, when it comes down to second closing, you know, it's kind of like the gates are closing for real now. So now they have to really get off um, and choose one way or the other. Whereas before, sometimes they feel like, you know, they can buy themselves an extra 12 to 18 months, whatever the closing date is. So it's kind of sometimes the second close, it's just as important as the first. Yeah. I mean, we have the the hurdle rate in our fund. So people are just paying that sort of late interest fee. And we also have markups in the, in the fund. So, you know, there's no way to charge that to the investors, but they do get a chance to come in and see sort of the progress the fund has made. So it's just sort of the way that, that the game is played. So let's talk about the offering of GP stake to strategic LPs. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't really talk about, but you kind of know it happens. Um, and it's something that people are always considering to get some of those larger LPs in. What are your thoughts on that? And, and what kind of structure works best from a, a standpoint of offering those, you know, class B GP stake shares? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have seen that it's not usually commonly done, um, you know, just given that, you know, it, it does create a little bit of misalignment, you know, from the current investors and, and bringing on new ones. What I, what I will see all more, more likely than not is 
especially if there's if there's been a hesitation for, from some LPs on the track record of a, of a GP. And so what I've seen is like uh, warehouse investments, you know, there's oftentimes a track record of, a, of an investor and oftentimes they use that track record in, in their fund materials, right? If, if they don't have a fund already, you kind of need to kind of need to go with what you have. Um, sometimes these investments are even through a safe, they're done kind of, you know, ad hoc, they're done, you know, just on a, a simple safe with a, with a check uh, put in there. And so what happens is if there's not enough fund interest to start to close, what I'll see these fund managers do is actually pull back and say, hey, we'll actually transfer in, you know, X, Y, and Z into the fund um, because it's such a good investment and offset what we have either on the GP commit or, on the, or we'll take it off the management fee. And that actually sometimes generates, you know, more interest in jumping into the, uh, into the fund. No, absolutely. Um, Andrew, you're up on stage. You want to ask a question to Chris? One of the hard things for an emerging manager to um, kind of predict as they're going through their first fund is expenses and, and how much to reserve. Uh, one of the hard parts about legal costs is you don't know how much it's going to be. You don't know uh, how often it's going to be. Uh, so it makes it hard to predict. Uh, for first-time managers in their first fund, uh, what would you see is you know, roughly typical, obviously, you know, lots of variables, including, you know, original hourly rate and, and activity level that they need. But uh, roughly, how much do, would you see uh, in legal expenses after the, the first initial uh, final closing? Two things. It, it really depends on which firm you're using or which lawyer. Uh, at, big, at the big firm level, you're, you're going to anticipate, um, I would say, at least 100 Hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You want to set aside. A lot of times, that you know, they work with you on on the uh, on the schedule of that. But that's generally what you would expect at that at that level. Um, if you're using a smaller firm or a solo lawyer, you know, you can expect around fifty thousand dollars with a typical setup. Uh, it can go up from there, but that's generally what I see. Uh, I do know lawyers that'll do it for less, but you're typically getting kind of a a cookie cutter form and you're getting kind of like, you know, hey, this is understood that you know fees aren't going to negotiate. So I've seen funds being formed for as little as twenty five thousand dollars. Geez, that sounds pretty cheap, twenty five thousand dollars. I don't know if I'd want to invest in that one. Um we got uh Deval on stage. Uh you got a question there? Piggybacking off of what Andrew asked, what do you guys think about using platforms like AngelList to start your first fund as you move on to fund two or fund three, hiring a a firm to set up your fund after that? Like what what Thoughts on pros and cons on using AngelList or a similar platform? Uh, Samir Kaji, before he left uh, First Republic, actually tweeted out in December and said, hey, what is everyone using for you know, X, Y, and Z? One of those was legal. And I was surprised by the number of responses of people who said AngelList, because uh, AngelList is obviously in a law firm. They don't do legal, but they do have an in-house legal team that'll help you know, for fund managers walk you through the process. They are extremely busy right now, so I don't think that they have a lot of spots available. Um, but assuming you can get one in there, I don't think it's a bad bet to have them, you know, handle a lot of the, a lot of the load. Uh, they, they charge a criminally low fee in the beginning <laughs> and then they, it kind of snowballs over time so that they kind of make up for it, you know, after some years go by. So, you know, to set everything up and have Angelus do it, have it very you know, turnkey is great. The only qualification of that of course is institutional investors do not like, you know, new things like that. So, uh, but, you know, if you're never going to have institutional, then it, I guess it doesn't matter. So, you know, I think it's not a bad strategy provided that you can get in and, and be that your, you know, LPs are, are comfortable with that. Uh, Andrew, uh, you're up on stage here. You got a question? I know that some funds are giving carry, uh, kind of breaking up the carry on a per deal basis to people that help them on the specific deal. Uh, how do you guys structure that? Have you seen that? So like if someone uh, can give a contact, can connect someone to a large customer, they might give them half a percent of uh, the carry on the deal, for example. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give kind of like the standard general, you know, big firm advice, which is don't get carry to non-GPs, um, anyone that's not a knowledgeable employee, quote unquote, that's a legal term of art. And anyone's not a knowledgeable employee or really at the executive level. Uh, should not be receiving a carried interest. And there's a number of reasons why. One of those is a broker-dealer issue. You, know, you, can't, um, you can't issue securities you know, in, without having a license attached to it. And so 
the other reason is uh, anytime you issue securities, even if it's just to an advisor who's helped out a lot, you actually have to comply with securities laws. And then one of those questions is, well, is this person uh, an accredited investor? Now, the law was just changed in December um, that allows you to actually consider your staff that's as long as they're a knowledgeable employee, which is, uh, I mean, I can give it a quick definition, any GP or any you know partner, any principal, anyone that touches the investment terms uh, has done so for 12 months, as long as actively managing or actively participating and is an employee is actually considered a knowledgeable employee and they're, they're an accredited investor. So you don't need to worry about that. So you can absolutely give carry to, you know, obviously provided that uh, you didn't follow that loss. But if you're just handing it out to someone who off the internet, you know, helped you out, close a deal and, and, they, and they're saying, hey, I want a piece of this carry. Do people do that? Yes. Is it, is it against the law? Probably. Um, you know, is the SEC going to go after you? You know, I mean, the risk level is pretty, you know, relatively low. But um, as, a, as a lawyer, of course, you know, if I was representing you or anyone in that, in that scenario, I would just say don't do it. Kunal, do you have a question? In the post-COVID world, all the emerging managers, basically, and the institutional versus retail investors coming to the light. Do you think it's about time that we see some sort of automation or disruption in, in terms of even the whole legal platform automation? Is a time like somebody really probably from, as a startup cracks that up? Uh, the answer is yes. I think I think it's definitely ripe for disruption, and I don't think there's too many lawyers that would agree with this statement. But um, very quickly, we're going to have because uh, you have seed legals in UK. Um, there's actually some other fund services that uh, rely on software. I myself use Doc Assembly software. For example, I use a program called Woodpecker. It just sits as an add-in to uh, my Microsoft Word, and so you know I'm using it from the from the lawyer level now. I'm not a programmer. I'm not anybody that can do anything special. And I know for a fact that we can get much, much, much more efficiency than we currently are using right now. And I, and just from the very base level of automating all just the, you know, rote information, the average LPA is, uh, you know, 56 pages, 30,000 words. It takes a long time just to get the form ready. And so having a uh, technology that can do that would be great. But there's really, you know, there, there's this push to, to take the lawyer out of the equation. I think we're a ways away from, from fully automation without the lawyer being present, at least on the fun side. You know, AngelList really does a mechanical Turk job. They don't, you know, they don't have fully automated systems. You know, sure, they have a platform as well, but again, it's not fully automated. And the problem that we're seeing, that I'm seeing, at least from my perspective, is oftentimes they're getting the law wrong. And I don't want to point fingers at AngelList or at, um, at Assure or any other people out there, but just the level of difficulty and the level of range you need to have to understand the laws out there is too great, really, for a system to capture it all. And I'll say this, um, you know, people at the top might know, but and, you know, they might be on Twitter, they might be on LinkedIn, really pushing out some quality content. But three levels down, that knowledge does not transfer easily. It, it's knowledge that's not sticky. When you, when, you, when you leverage completely to a third-party platform, you know, you've got to be sure that it, if, if the risk is not too great, it's fine. If, if your LPs are not comfortable with it or if you're just not sure, you know, just take the, uh, take the extra cost and um, go with somebody that, that knows how to do it and is consistently going to earn it. You pay for what you get, I guess, is what you're saying, Chris. And uh... It's kind of like when buying high quality performance sporting gear. You don't want to go with the stuff that's going to probably make you slide off the back of the mountain. So we'll take one more question. Uh, if, uh, if Drew or maybe uh, Michael or Nick have a question, just uh, please pop up. Yeah, this is Michael. We're having the lucky problem of potentially three of our portfolio companies being spac this year. And which means that I can very quickly have stock and lockup. Um, and one of the questions came up today in one of our staff meetings was, is there anything that prevents a fund from being able to, within the fund itself, to hedge that stock position in that lockup and not have the hedge position end up violating any of the rules that go into what can happen within a limited liability partnership like that? Yeah. So, I mean, in the U.S. anyway, so VCs rely on a uh, venture capital exemption. You know, that requires five elements. One of those elements is 
it has to be qualifying investment. Qualifying investment essentially is security issued by directly by the uh, portfolio company. So safes, price rounds, blah, blah, blah. Anytime that you're hedging your bet through a public market, uh, those are non-qualifying investments. And so you just have to look at your, your ratio of how many, you know, how much are we doing on the non-qualifying investment, which is, you know, it may, it may be, and also too, you can't, you can't really leverage uh, your short-term lending because you're also uh, subject to limitations on that as well. So, you know, what may be the solution is actually, you know, creating a, a second fund or, you know, looking at potentially um, you know, setting up a parallel fund to, to cover those, those hedges. Chris, I don't know if this is something that uh, Michael can consider as well, but would it be possible to enter into a forward agreement to sell those shares before the lockup expires? And then once they do, he can just transfer them over? Or? Um, actually, one of the companies we're looking at is actually doing that with a secondary that we're participating in. So that was one of our considerations was use that method as well. So I think we have some homework to do. Yeah. So we've been doing that just so you know, Michael, at Ripple Capital, which is our uh, later stage sort of pre-IPO secondary fund. And uh, we've been doing some forward contracts with employees um, and, and basically the funds just go into escrow and we receive them once the lockup expires. And if they don't deliver, they don't get the, the capital. Uh, the buyers can do what they want, but you can just enter into a legal contract with with your counsel or someone else to help you uh, structure that. So definitely something to consider as well. Well, awesome. Those are some great questions. Thanks so much for everyone for, for joining us uh, on stage. Uh, before we uh, wrap things up, Chris, I would love to ask if you have any great book recommendations for the audience to consider uh, when thinking about anything that you've really enjoyed. Yeah, I just picked up the third edition of The Business of Venture Capital. And um, it's the art of raising a fund, structuring investments, portfolio management, and exits. I enjoyed the earlier versions, but I think it's been, uh, it just came out in 2021. And it's got a Ford by Scott Kapoor in it. And it, I think it's one of the best books out there. It really gives you um, a, a good analysis of what's heavily negotiated, priorities, what are industry best practices. And uh, I would start there for, for the fund side. Perfect. And then lastly, uh, any final words of inspiration or advice for emerging managers or people looking out there to start their first fund? Yeah, a lot of times people talk about the, the terms of the fund and the legal, but really what it comes down to is being able to sell this uh, story. Managers of money are the ones who can tell you know, the best story and, and deliver on that. And so one way to, to help that is uh, I, I, I recommend you know, that fund managers take a stab at writing in public. It's uh, something that I picked up over the last couple of years. You know, I have a, I have a lawvc.com that's uh, or law VC is my, my newsletter, but it really, what it does, it opens up opportunities. It really allows you to understand the, uh, the narrative structure and also, you know, kind of the why of what you're doing and why it matters. And it pulls you out of the weeds. And, and I mean, I'm stuck in a contract, you know, 70 page contract. And sometimes I lose sight of, you know, why are we doing things? Communicating in public, like we're doing on, uh, you know, on here, is, is just one of the ways to, to tell to tell that story. Nah, that's awesome advice, and I couldn't agree more. I literally just wrote a blog post, the first one I've done in a while, on why we lead rounds at Venture at Ripple Ventures, and uh, it definitely feels good to have that sort of brain dump uh, for things that uh, you just said as to why we do these kind of things. So I, co I completely agree. Well, thanks so much for joining us on Clubhouse today for another Ripple Ventures Tank Talk episode, Chris. And I'll make sure everyone can check out the lawvcsubstack.com. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks again, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to give me a follow on Twitter or Clubhouse if you want to be in the audience and ask a question on our next Tank Talk. Till next time, 